So in this video, we're going to find the expected value of momentum squared. In order to do that, we're going to use this expression for xi of x. So this looks kind of different from what we had before, but this is just another way of writing out the original xi of x that we had. So this is just a way of getting rid of the absolute value of x. So you can see that there's this theta of x over here, which is really just the step function that came in from the previous problem. So the step function was defined as being equal to 1 when x is larger than 0, and being 0 when x is smaller than 0. So both of these terms are actually completely the same. It's just a different way of expressing this, and I'm just using this theta of x to help out. And the reason why I've expressed xi of x in such a way is because you can see that the graph of xi of x, it is continuous, but it is actually not smooth. So at this very point, the derivative is actually not well defined. And so this will affect what the second derivative should be. And as you know, when we're trying to find the expected value of momentum squared, we need to find the second derivative of the, uh, xi of x. So that's why I'm going to uh, need the help of these uh, step functions uh, to help us capture what ex exactly is going to happen to the second derivative when x is equal to 0. So let's just get rid of this. So that is why I'm using the theta of x in this, in this problem. So now let's try to find the, sec uh, the expected value of momentum squared. So as always, we just apply the, apply the definition. We have the conjugate of psi of x, and then we have the momentum operator squared applied to psi of x. And then now I can just pull these constants out. And then you can see that we have the conjugate multiplied by the second derivative of psi of x. So now our focus would be on finding what the second derivative should be. So now we need to go back here. So now our goal is to find the second derivative of psi of x. And also, uh, before I proceed, I'm going to define some constant L to be equal to these constants. So this will just save me a bit of time. So you can see that I can rewrite uh, this entire expression into something like this. So you can see that this is going to save me a bit of time. So now we, uh, we can start uh, differentiating this. So in order to find the second derivative, we start off with the first derivative. And uh, also, we're going to use one of the results from the previous problem. So remember that the derivative of the step function is actually equal to the direct delta function. So this is a, a result from the previous problem that we're going to use as well. So differentiating this, we differentiate theta of x, which, which is just the uh, direct delta function. And then we retain the e term. And then we have theta of x, and then we differentiate this. So we have negative l squared e to the power of negative l squared x. And then we do the same here. We have delta of negative x times negative 1. So this is because of the chain rule. I need to differentiate the negative x as well. And then we have this e term. And then we retain this term, and then we differentiate this, which becomes l squared e to the power of l squared x. So before we move on, we can actually simplify this term a bit. Uh, you can see that this uh, delta of negative x, uh, we call this formula over here, which we also derive from the previous problem. We can simplify delta of some constant times x into this expression. So you can see we have a negative 1 times x. So I can just simplify this into a direct delta function divided by a 1 uh, the absolute value of negative 1, which is just equal to 1, so I can just get rid of it entirely. And then also, recall that we also have this formula, which Griffiths provided to us at the, at the beginning of this section. And so you can see that we can also apply it to these two expressions as well. You can see that uh, according to this formula, uh, you can see that in this case, this is just a case of when a is equal to 0. And then if you have some function multiplied by the direct delta function, I can replace the function to be equal to the function evaluated at a. So this is going to be the function for this case. So I can, instead of writing e to the power of negative l square x, I can just substitute a into this expression, which in this case is equal to 0. So I can just substitute x is equal to 0 for this expression. And you can see that e to the power of 0, that's just equal to 1. So I can further simplify this by taking away this term entirely, So because it's, it's just equal to 1. And once again, I could do the exact same thing over here. Uh, this is just going to be equal to 1 when x is evaluated at 0. So you see that there's a direct delta function minus a direct delta function. So it turns out both of these cancel each other, other out, which is always good news. 
And so in the end, we have such an expression. So we're pulling the L squares out, and then we have theta of negative x times e to the power of L square x, and then minus theta of x e to the power of negative L square x. So this will be the first derivative. And now we're going to try to find the second derivative. So what we're going to do is that we're going to dif differentiate this term. So let's just pull the constants out. Now d dx is going to be applied to uh, these terms over here. We have minus theta of x e to the power of negative l squared x. So the procedure is, gonna, is just going to, uh, this whole thing is just going to proceed like last time. So we just differentiate this, theta, uh, delta of negative x times negative 1 because of the chain rule. We retain this term, and then this time we retain the step function, and then we differentiate the e term. And then we do the same here. We differentiate the step function, then we retain the step function, we differentiate this, which is negative l squared e to the power of negative l squared x. And then once again, we can do a bit of the simplifications we did last time. So instead of delta of negative x, we can write this as delta x. And then, uh, like last time, we're going to apply this formula. So we just substitute 0 for these two e terms, which just becomes 1. So we can just get rid of this. And you can see that this time, these direct delta functions don't cancel out. So last time, they canceled out. But this time, it, they don't, because both of them have a negative 1 sign. So instead of cancelling out, this time we have two direct delta functions uh, sticking around. And then here we have L squared theta of negative x e to the power of L squared x plus L squared theta x e to the power of negative L squared x. So now this is the second derivative. So using this, we will be able to uh, find what the expected value of p squared should be. And Actually, uh, one way to further simplify this term is that instead of using uh, theta of x, now we can combine them back together using the uh, absolute value sign. So remember, I introduced the theta of x just to capture what exactly will happen when we take the second derivative. And you can see that we've already captured the, the weirdness that happens at x is equal to 0 because we have this uh, direct delta function here. So the step function has pretty much outlived its usefulness. So I can just take it back away and then uh, return the, uh, give back the absolute value sign to, the, to this expression. So now using this expression, we can plug it into this formula to find what the expected value of p squared should be. So continuing with uh, this expression that we have. So we have the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity. And then you can see that we need to substitute in the conjugate of the of xi of x. So we just substitute in uh, xi of x because the conjugate of xi of x is just equal to xi of x because this entire term is uh, is real. And then using the convention where we use l in place of the in place of all the uh, constants, we have l times e to the power of negative l square times the absolute value of x. So we just substitute this back over here. So l times negative e to the power of negative l squared, absolute value of x. So that is this term. And now we substitute in the second derivative of psi of x. So we have l to the power of 3, uh, the constants over here. And then we have 2, negative 2, delta of x. And then we also have plus l squared times e to the power of negative l squared, absolute value of x, dx. So I didn't copy it wrong. So yeah, this is the expression that we're going to integrate. So we can pull out some of these constants. So just pull out this l to the power of 4 to the outside. And you can see that we have two terms. We have a term that is that involves a direct delta function. And then, so these are, pull, uh, these are outside of the integral. Let's just remind ourselves of that. And then here we also have another l square. So this will be inside the integral. And then you can see that these two e terms will, will be multiplied together. So the exponent becomes 2. So this is our integral. So we need to deal with these two terms. So in order to deal with this term, this is going to be easy enough because we can just apply the definition of a direct delta function. So previously in this section, we proved that this expression 
it's just going to be equal to f of 0. So all we have to do is just to replace this expression with f of 0. You can see that we're just integrating uh, the direct delta function times some function. So this would be the f of x from this formula. So this integral will just be equal to f of 0. So we're just substituting 0 into the e term. And so don't forget we have a negative 2. So, so this term is just becomes negative 2. So it's negative 2 times this function evaluated at 0, which is 1. So we have negative 2 times 1. And then we also have this integral over here. So now our remaining challenge would be to evaluate this integral. And then instead of going from negative infinity to positive infinity, you can see that this is actually an even function. So it's symmetrical about the y-axis. So I can just let this go from 0 to infinity and then multiply by 2. Because the section that goes from negative infinity to 0 is going to be identical to the section from 0 to infinity. So I can just let it go from 0 to infinity and then put a 2 over here. And then since we're now, x is going to uh, be strictly inside this uh, positive domain, we don't need the absolute value sign anymore. So this just becomes x. And now this is easy enough to evaluate. This just becomes, so we differentiate this. We put the negative 2l squared down the bottom, and then we evaluate this from negative uh, 0 to positive infinity. So we have uh, this expression, and evaluate it from 0 to positive infinity. And so now you can see that uh, these two L squares, they all cancel out, which is always a good thing. So once you substitute infinity inside this term, you can see that we have uh, e to the power of negative infinity, which is just equal to 0. And then when you substitute 0, you get 1. And don't forget there's a minus sign over here. So you get 0 minus negative 1, so which is just equal to positive 1. So this just becomes positive 1. And you have a negative 2, so it just becomes negative 1. And then you have a negative sign outside, so it just becomes positive 1. So in the end, you get h bar squared times l to the power of 4. And then don't forget what l uh, is equal to. So remember that we defined l to be equal to this term. So l is equal to the square root of m alpha divided by h bar squared. So l to the power of 4, that's just equal to m squared alpha squared divided by h bar to the power of, uh, of 4. So looks like I wrote something wrong. This should be h bar. So I copied it wrong. The denominator should be h bar. And then you can see that both of these, they cancel out. So in the end, your result is m alpha divided by h bar square. So this is your expected value of momentum square, which is exactly what we expect it to be.